Hey everyone, I'm Sylvie, the studio coordinator here at Halstead. And what we are doing today, this one is your technical training. So we're going to talk about the machine, we're going to talk about how to use it, and how to actually weld a bracelet onto someone. So the first thing that we want to talk about is the machine, which is this little dude right here, and it is the Orion Impulse. So it's a great machine. Um, it can do a lot. This is the lowest level of these pulse arc welders. That's what they're called. Basically, it's a you're you're actually welding, you're TIG welding just on a really small scale. So the impulse is the lowest level of the pulse arc welders, and then you can go up in levels from there that gives you more control. So it allows you to change the power with more range. It also allows you to change the size of the weld, and it just gives you more control. So that's definitely something that you want to think about when purchasing your machine is, do you want the most basic level? Are you using it only for permanent jewelry or just to weld jump rings? Or are you going to be doing a lot of other things with it um, that you would be using it for other jewelry applications, like tacking bezels to a back sheet or tacking tubes for tricky soldering. So if that is what you're looking for, you might want to investigate one of the higher level options that gives you a little bit more control. And so this is the base and what you definitely want to make sure that you do is also have an argon tank. So I'm going to go into the setup of the machine a little bit and some of the things that you want to make sure that you have. So in general, the first thing that you want to do is you want to read the manual. Always read the manual, especially when it comes to slightly more advanced machines like this that you might not have experience with. It will show you where all of these connection points go, how to hook up your argon tank, and all of that good stuff. And it's really a very simple process. There's ports in the back of the machine. They match up with the plugs. So it's really very simple. So let me talk a little bit about argon. So because, as I mentioned, you are welding just on a very small scale, you need to use argon. And what argon is, it is a shielding gas. So every time that electric current comes out of your welding pen, the argon gas creates a little bubble around it. And what it does is it shields your weld from getting any oxygen in there. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a cleaner weld as well as a stronger weld. So it is definitely highly recommended and I won't weld without it. So we also, I've got my tank right here. It's right behind me. And argon is not a flammable gas, but it is under pressure. Um, so you want to make sure to chain it to a chain it to the wall, chain it to a table, have it in a little carrier like I have it in so that it's not going to tip over. And we also got our argon from Pepe Tools. It was great. It came pre-filled and it also came with a regulator on it. And what the regulator does is it sets the appropriate pressure. Um, and because we're welding on this small scale, the, the pressure is set very low. It's at seven PSI or pounds per square inch. And because it's at that low pressure, you need a special regulator that goes that low. So it's advantageous to buy your argon from a jewelry supplier like Pepe because it's going to come with everything that you need. Um, and what they, the kind of argon that they give you is pure argon. So it's the highest percentage. There's nothing, no other gases in there. And when you run out, you can always send it back to get refilled or you can take it to your local welding supply store. But it's awesome to get that original tank and regulator from someone who knows what application you're using it for. So. Let's get started with turning on our machine and everything. There's a little switch on the back here that I'm just going to click on and it makes a fun little beeping sound and also I have a light now. 
So I've got that on and now I'm going to turn on my argon and I'm going to set it to seven PSI. So I'm opening the tank all the way and then I'm going to dial that regulator until it says seven. Okay, now that that's all set up, I wanna make sure that my pen, my welding pen is nice and set up. So the one of the main things that you wanna make sure that you've got here is a really sharp piece of tungsten. So that, the tungsten rod is what sticks out of your welding pen and it's what's actually doing the welding. That's where the electricity comes from. It comes right down that tungsten rod onto your piece and fuses that metal together. So I've got a sharp tungsten in here and you wanna make sure that's set to the right length. So all you do is you pull off this tip so it just snaps in there and you can just pull it off like that and if I place the nose cone at the brass collet there's a little line here and I just want to make sure that the tip of my tungsten fits somewhere in that line and that means it's at the perfect length because if it's out too far or not enough that's going to affect the quality of your weld. So I've got a sharp clean tungsten in here. I've set it to the right length and I click my, my collet in and I can put it back in the holder. But now I know that that's all set up and ready to go. Now, as I mentioned, the machine comes with the proper tools to clean your tungsten and get it nice and sharp. And what that is, is a diamond wheel. So it's a wheel that goes in your flux shaft or your Fordham handpiece, a rotary tool, and it's got little bits of crushed diamond on it and you're going to hold your tungsten rod on there while it spins and you'll spin the rod to keep it as nice and even and that allows you to resharpen the tip to clean it off if there gets any metal on it or anything like that. The cleaner your tungsten, the better the weld you're going to have. So now that you've got that figured out, let's talk about this portion of the machine. And that is your auto darkening lens. So it is critical. I can't stress this enough, how important it is that you are looking through either your auto darkening lens or a pair of dark welding glasses. Um, because the light, that, that, that spark that comes out when you weld it is incredibly bright and it will burn your retinas if you look at it without one of these. So you absolutely wanna have that for yourself and your clients because it's super fun for them to be able to watch the weld while it's happening. So you wanna provide dark glasses for them. Um, and if they have friends that wanna watch, also recommend that they watch through their phone cameras. Um, that dulls the light enough that it's not a hazard to the eyes anymore, but you have to look through the phone camera or a pair of these dark glasses. Make sure to have a minimum of a shade five darkness. So welding glasses come in different shades from three all the way up to 12, um, but shade five is the minimum of what you're going to want. So the ADL or the auto darkening lens that is attached to the machine is a really great option because it starts out at a lighter shade and when the weld happens, it flashes super dark. Now, if you are someone who doesn't have great eyes, you may choose to opt to add magnification as well. So it can be something as simple as a pair of optivizers, um, reader glasses that will magnify, or you can purchase the microscope arm that, that goes with the machine and that will also auto darken, which is super nice. But what, no matter what magnification you're using, you want to always make sure that you are using the dark glasses as well. 
So now we're going to talk about actually setting up the machine and some of the settings that you're going to be using. So I briefly talked about the correct way to set the length of your tungsten, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth into that one. So I mentioned that this nose piece just pulls right out. So you're just going to pull it right out and you twist this and that opens up the collet of where your tungsten goes so you can put it in and out, take it out to clean it. Um, and what you also want to make sure that you're doing with your tungsten is setting it to the appropriate shape. So. Many have talked about welding silver versus gold. Um, and if you're using silver, what people recommend is that you use a blunted tip. So you can use your little diamond disc that came with the machine and just round out the tip of that tungsten. Um, and that's recommended because sil silver moves a lot when it gets heated up. So in that welding process, is it, if it's super sharp, your, the tip of your tungsten, it's a very pointed and direct weld, so it's going to blow through your metal, uh, whereas if it's rounded and blunt, it kind of spreads that power out a little bit, and it just works better for silver. I personally haven't noticed too much of a difference, but you might, and you might, um, want to play around with what works better for you. So you've got your sharp tip and I have a blunted tip on the other end so that if I'm welding silver versus gold for different clients, it's really easy. I can just switch one tungsten back and forth. So I'm going to put that in and I'm also going to set my length. So I'm holding my nose cone right up to the edge of that brass collet and I'm looking at the tip of my tungsten to make sure that it falls between those two lines on my collet. And then I'm just going to tighten that up by turning it. I'll double check that and then click that back into place and place it back in the holder. Now, I like to use it in the holder. You don't have to if you don't want to. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to set the power of our machine. And that is measured in watts per second or joules. So the impulse, the lowest power setting that it has is a three and it goes up to 30. The other machines have a larger range. So typically with permanent jewelry, you're going to be somewhere between five and nine, but the power setting that you are using is very dependent on what type of material you're using. So whether that's sterling silver or 14 karat gold, and also the thickness of the material. Are you using a 24 gauge jump ring or a 20 gauge jump ring? So thinner versus thicker, those are the considerations that you're going to take in when setting your power. And the machine is awesome because it comes with this little practice plate here. So it's a little stainless steel plate that allows you to test the weld size. So the max weld power is 30 joules. Um, so that's over here. And then we've got it at three over here. And you can see the different size, how more power creates a larger weld. So this is a great thing to play around with before you start welding. And I'm going to set my machine to seven because I, that's what I'm going to be using for one of my jump rings. And it's just a little, little slide over here. And then we also have a plus and a minus button if you want to add it or take away power in smaller increments. And the first thing that you're always gonna do is you're gonna push this little on button. And once that turns orange, then you know it's ready to fire. And personally, I always, I write down what my settings are for exactly what I'm using. So I've got SJ33 here, which is a three millimeter, 24 gauge jump ring. And the perfect setting for that is seven. So I've just written it down here as a quick cheat sheet for myself 
so I always know what power I need. And it's also great if you have employees because they can follow the cheat sheet as well. So always a great option to have one of those. And then the next thing that you need to do after setting the power is make sure that you have your grounding clamp. So I have the tiny one on here because we are working in a very small scale, right? But it all, the machine also comes with a slightly larger one. And it's up to you whether you want to clip directly to the piece or to your pliers. Um, but what you want to make sure is that you have that complete electric circuit. If your clamp is not clamped to the metal, the machine will not fire and it will not weld. It needs to be that complete circuit. Um, so a lot of times I will clamp to the pliers because they're metal. So I'm clamping to my metal pliers and then my metal pliers are holding a jump ring because I find that just a little bit more comfortable. Um, but that's up to you. You can clamp directly to the jump ring. Um, you can buy grounding pliers. So the pliers themselves are the grounding clamp and they connect directly to your machine, um, which is another great option if you find that more comfortable. So you've got to have that circuit completed, otherwise it won't fire. So we've got our pliers in here, we're grounded, our machine is set to the correct power, and now it's time to measure the chain to our client's wrist. So I've got a super fun paper clip chain here, and when you're measuring it to your client's wrist, you want to make sure that there is not a lot of space. You want barely a pinky finger of extra space between the wrist and the chain. And that's because you don't want it to get caught on things. You want it to be snug to the wrist with like a little wiggle room, but not too big because then it's more likely to catch on things. And as these are permanent bracelets, they don't come off. They don't have a clasp. So you want to make sure that they're snug so they're less likely to catch on things. Um, and then in one of our other segments, um, talking about your materials, we're going to talk about the size chain and why that's an important consideration when you're starting permanent jewelry. So we're going to measure that chain to our client's wrist, and then we're going to talk about welding. Okay, so you've got your chain fitted to your client's wrist, and if you have any scrap chain left over when you get to the end of your little spool, save that. Don't get rid of your chain because that's precious metal and what you can do is you can send it in for refining and you'll get money back. So jump rings that don't work out exactly right or you know two inches left of chain that aren't going to fit around someone's wrist, save that, put it in a little jar, and then you can send it in and get money back. So don't forget to do that. Now, it's up to you whether you want to weld the chain link directly or use a jump ring. So right here with this fun paper clip chain, if I want to, I can weld that chain link directly because it's a larger link and it's a little bit easier for me to maneuver in. And if you're going to do that, you're going to want to use your little snips and you're going to snip contrary to what you might think, on the short end of the chain. So that's right there. Because once your bracelet falls back into place, it's going to hide that weld. Um, so always do it on the short end as opposed to the long end. So you would snip right there, and then you can link that chain link right back through the bracelet itself and then it's completely seamless and you don't even see a jump ring. If you want to use a jump ring, you are more than 
welcome to. I like to because if the client needs to cut the bracelet off for some reason, they can snip at that jump ring and you can replace it. And the chain is the same size. You don't need to cut a new piece of chain or anything like that. So for me, the jump ring just adds a little bit more flexibility to the bracelet. Um, but that's up to you whether you want a more seamless look. So if I'm using this paperclip chain, I'm going to use an oval jump ring because it visually fits a little bit better. So I'm using SJ250, which is one of our oval jump rings. And regardless of whether you're using a jump ring or the chain link itself, the first thing you want to do is make sure that it is tightened up really good. You don't want any space when you close it up. So to do that, if our jump ring is open, what we're going to do is we are going to brush the ends of that jump ring or chain link back and forth past each other and you're going to kind of feel them rub against each other and click a little bit and that's good. That means that you've got a really nice tight closure. So I'm just going to close that up. Super tight. And so that's on our client's wrist now. And what you're going to do is you're going to move it underneath your welder or you can take the pen out and weld it, you know, just on the table if that's more comfortable for you. Always remember your auto, your dark, dark lenses. And we like to put a little piece of leather just underneath that chain between the client's wrist and the chain because it's just a little extra added protection. So you're going to put that in, you'll come under, and then right where that seam is, you're going to hold it up to your electrode and at 90 degrees to the electrode, you're going to gently touch the jump ring or the chain link to the electrode. So you could hear that fire, it kind of, you hear a little puff of, a little puff and that's your argon coming out and your lens goes dark and then you hear a beep and it flashes your weld. So the way that that weld actually works is your tungsten is touching your jump ring and then when it fires, the tungsten pulls back during that firing process. Because when you're doing the actual weld, you don't want the tungsten touching your metal, otherwise it will stick to it. So when you get into place and you gently touch it, the machine senses the metal and it will pull back that electrode for, for you. So don't move your jump ring or your chain because it will do that for you. Um, and once you pull it out, you're going to use your glass brush, which I talked about earlier, and you're just gonna wipe that little black mark off. And all that is, is a little bit of soot. It comes right off with that glass brush. It's not a big deal. And now you have a welded jump ring or chain link and your client is all set. So now that that's, that's your basic process of welding a bracelet onto a client, it's not super difficult, but it does require a little bit of trial and error and a little bit of practice. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the machine and some of the tools that you use with it. So these pliers that come with it, they are your kind of base factory settings. They are meant to be altered if you would like to. So if you feel like these are a little too sharp on the edge, you can take some sandpaper and round them out and make it a little bit softer, but always make sure that you're just using sandpaper. You don't want to take them to a high polish because that's a little too reflective and it can be hard to get in there and see what you're doing with that, especially with the weld spark. So feel free to alter your pliers if you would like to and your tools. And that may also mean, um, you know, 
filing off or sanding off some of the paint on them, like these snips have paint on them. If your pliers had paint, you could file that away and then you can ground directly to your pliers, but you always need to make sure that that's metal on metal. So you can do that. You can work with a set of grounding pliers, like I already mentioned. Um, and then the other thing that you can do with these machines is use filler wire. So what we just did was we fused the metal to itself. Now if you use filler wire, what it's doing is it's melting additional wire into that joint. So that your filler wire typically is going to be the same material that your weld is going to be in. So if you're using a sterling silver jump ring, you would want to use sterling silver filler wire, um, or it's going to be the same color. So if you are using gold filled, you would use 14 karat gold filler wire. Um, and what filler wire is, is it's pretty much just regular metal wire, but it's really, really thin. It's 30 gauge. And that's so that when you add it in there, it's just a little bit of metal and it doesn't overwhelm. Um, and you can use that to add material to your joint if you need to. Now, we do not recommend that you use gold fill for permanent jewelry because it is a layered product. So that means that there's a layer of gold with a different material on the inside, which is typically jeweler's brass. And if you're wearing a bracelet all of the time, that material can wear away, exposing the brass underneath, and then therefore you might get tarnish or skin discoloration or something like that. Now, we know that not all clients are going to be able to afford that, so just be very mindful of that. And if you are using gold filled, always make sure that you use filler wire to, to weld those jump rings or chain links because when you're doing that weld, what you're doing is you're melting all of those layers together. So that little spot where your weld is can turn black or tarnish or discolor because what it's done is it's melted those layers together and it's no longer pure gold on the surface, which tarnishes um, very, not quite as easily. So always add filler wire or use a 14 karat solid jump ring with gold filled chain. However, like I said, we recommend that you don't use gold fill and you do use solid gold because it's just a longer lasting product. So filler wire is something that you can use if you would like to. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about the welds and some of the problems that you're going to see or some things that you might encounter as you're first starting out and learning with the machine. So when your machine is set perfectly, you're going to weld that jump ring and it's going to look almost exactly seamless. Now, if your power is too high and your jump ring isn't exactly closed, we're going to talk about what you're going to see when those things happen. So first of all, if you don't have enough power, you're going to zap your jump ring and you're going to see a little line there. It won't have fused the metal together. Now you can get around that by zapping one side and then zapping the other side. And so that's coming at it from both sides and that will create a complete weld or you may just need to turn the power up. Now, if you have too much power, what's going to happen is your jump ring will have a flat spot on it. So as you zap it, it's going to kind of flatten it because it's really intense and it's just like, I can't handle it. So it'll go flat and it will kind of look like a D-shaped ring. And so that you would want to just turn the power down a little bit. If your jump ring is not closed completely, so if those two sides are not touching each other nice and snug, what you might encounter is you go to zap it and then it blows apart and you've got two balls on either end and it 
big gap in the middle. So that's just fussing with it to make sure that you get the clothes really nice and tight. And if you want to, you know, during this practice process, you know, play around with the sharp electrode and the blunt tipped electrode and see which ones perform better for you. Play with the settings with the materials that you're going to be using and it will help you really just dial it down before you start to work with clients. And then the last troubleshooting jump ring issue that you might encounter would be a bump at your weld. And that typically happens when you have filler wire and what you would want to do is just weld around it and it will kind of smooth that bump out a little bit. Now, as you're using the machine and you're welding a lot, you're using it and it's awesome, your electrode is going to get dirty and in the early days of practicing, you might have some sticking. Um, so that's when the electrode sticks to the metal because it, it moved during the weld and it was touching it. So you're just going to use that diamond disc again to clean up your electrode and get it nice and sharp and clean again because a cleaner electrode will always perform better. Um, and now, I don't know if you saw, but I touched that electrode right here with my finger. So this is a very safe process. The electrode will not fire if, it, if the grounding clip is not grounded to metal and if your metal doesn't touch that tip. So it's really very safe. We have the leather just for extra precaution because the electrode is sharp. So if your client moves their wrist um, and you don't know, it could scratch it or something like that. But if this isn't gonna fire if you're just touching it like this. You have to have it grounded and it has to be touching metal. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So I don't want anyone freaking out thinking that you can like zap people because that's not going to happen. When you get into the higher settings, the jump ring can get hot right after that, that weld because you are transferring electricity to it and it is melting that metal. So just be mindful of that. Don't have your client touch it right after the weld, but it cools down very quickly. So just zap, take it away, and then you're good to go. Um, it, it's a pretty quick cool down process, but something to be mindful of. So that's, that's it. That's the basics of using the welder and welding on a bracelet to your client. Now, I can't stress this enough, practice. Practice, practice, practice with this machine. You're gonna blow through a couple jump rings in the beginning as you're working on getting those settings right. You're going to have some trouble possibly closing your jump rings all the way, and that's okay, but it's really, just finding the right settings for you and your, your supplies because everyone's going to be using different chains and different jump rings and you're going to have personal preferences and that means that those settings are going to be a little bit different. So I have my little cheat sheet here, like I said. So on our, 20, our 24 gauge, three millimeter jump rings in silver, I use a setting seven. Now when I'm working with gold, same size jump ring, three millimeter, 24 gauge, but it's solid 14 karat gold, I drop that setting down to five because I mentioned the different materials are going to affect your settings. And my oval jump rings here, they're a little bit thicker. They're 22 gauge instead of 24. So I'm, I bump my setting up to eight watts per second. So I've got a little bit more power to get through that extra thickness. So practice with your jump rings, without a bracelet, without a wrist, anything like that. Just kind of get the feel for the weld and then use your friends, use your family as guinea pigs, weld bracelets onto them because it's going to feel very different once you've actually got a wrist under there than when you're just holding a jump ring under there yourself. So it takes just a little bit of practice to find out what that best positioning is and then 
whether or not you want to use the welding pen in the holder or you want to take it out and use it that way. That's personal preference, but it is just practice. So don't just factor that in, okay? Just a little bit of practice and then you'll be good to go and ready to start on parties in your boutique or pop-ups, anything that you're looking to do with permanent jewelry. So that is our technical how-to on this. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at studio at halsteadbead.com. That's my email. You'll get to me and you can ask me te technical questions. Also, as you're starting your permanent jewelry journey, please tag us and follow us on social media because we love to see what you're doing. So that's at Halstead Jewelry Supplies on Instagram and TikTok. And we're on Facebook because we love to see what you're doing. So share with us, reach out, and happy jeweling.